Chapter Twenty, Part One of Fifty Years in Chains, or the Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Fifty Years in Chains, or the Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter Twenty, Part One. The name of my new master was Jones, a planter, who was only a visitor in this part of the country, his residence being about fifty miles down the country. The next day my new master set off with me to the place of his residence, permitting me to walk behind him as he rode on horseback, and leaving me entirely unshackled. I was resolved that, as my owner treated me with so much liberality, the trust he reposed in me should not be broken until after we had reached his home. Though the determination of again running away and attempting to escape from Georgia never abandoned me for a moment. The country through which we passed on our journey was not rich. The soil was sandy, light, and in many places much exhausted by excessive tillage. The timber, in the woods where the ground was high, was almost exclusively pine, but many swamps and extensive tracts of low ground intervened, in which maple, gum, and all the other trees common to such land in the south abounded. No improvement in the condition of the slaves on the plantations was here perceptible, but it appeared to me that there was now even a greater want of good clothes amongst the slaves on the various plantations that we passed than had existed twenty years before. Everywhere the overseers still kept up the same custom of walking in the fields with the long whip that has been elsewhere described, and everywhere the slaves proved by the husky appearance of their skins and the dry sunburnt aspect of their hair that they were strangers to animal food. On the second day of our journey, in the evening, we arrived at the residence of my master, about eighty miles from Savannah. The plantation which had now become the place of my residence was not large, containing only about three hundred acres of cleared land, and having on it about thirty working slaves of all classes. It was now the very midst of the season of picking cotton, and at the end of twenty years from the time of my first flight, I again had a daily task assigned me, with the promise of half a cent a pound for all the cotton I should pick beyond my day's work. Picking cotton, like every other occupation requiring active manipulation, depends more upon slight than strength, and I was not now able to pick so much in a day as I was once able to do. My master seemed to be a man ardently bent on the acquisition of wealth, and came into the field where we were at work almost every day, frequently remonstrating in strong language with the overseer because he did not get more work done. Our rations on this place were half a peck of corn per week, in addition to which we had rather more than a peck of sweet potatoes allowed to each person. Our provisions were distributed to us on every Sunday morning by the overseer, but my master was generally present, either to see that justice was done to us or that injustice was not done to himself. When I had been here about a week, my master came into the field one day, and in passing near me stopped and told me that I had now fallen into good hands, as it was his practice not to whip his people much that he in truth never whipped them, nor suffered his overseer to whip them, except in flagrant cases, that he had discovered a mode of punishment much more mild, and at the same time much more effectual than flogging, and that he governed his negroes exclusively under this mode of discipline. He then told me that when I came home in the evening I must come to the house, and that he would then make me acquainted with the principles upon which he chastised his slaves. Going to the house in the evening, according to orders, my master showed me a pump, set in a well, in which the water rose within ten feet of the surface of the ground. The spout of this pump was elevated at least thirteen feet above the earth, and when the water was to be drawn from it, 
the person who worked the handle ascended by a ladder to the proper station. The water in this well, although so near the surface, was very cold, and the pump discharged it in a large stream. One of the women employed in the house had committed some offence for which she was to be punished, and the opportunity was embraced of exhibiting to me the effect of this novel mode of torture upon the human frame. The woman was stripped quite naked, and tied to a post that stood just under the stream of water, as it fell from the spout of the pump. A lad was then ordered to ascend the ladder and pump water upon the head and shoulders of the victim, who had not been under the waterfall more than a minute before she began to cry and scream in a most lamentable manner. In a short time she exerted her strength in the most convulsive throes in trying to escape from the post, but as the cords were strong this was impossible. After another minute or a little more her cries became weaker, and soon afterwards her head fell forward upon her breast, and then the boy was ordered to cease pumping the water. The woman was removed in a state of insensibility, but recovered her faculties in about an hour. The next morning she complained of lightness of head, but was able to go to work. This punishment of the pump, as it is called, was never inflicted on me, and I am only able to describe it as it has been described to me by those who have endured it. When the water first strikes the head and arms it is not at all painful, but in a very short time it produces the sensation that is felt when heavy blows are inflicted with large rods of the size of a man's finger. This perception becomes more and more painful, until the skull-bone and shoulder-blades appear to be broken in pieces. Finally all the faculties become oppressed, breathing becomes more and more difficult, until the eyesight becomes dim and animation ceases, this punishment is, in fact, a temporary murder, as all the pains are endured that can be felt by a person who is deprived of life by being beaten with bludgeons. But after the punishment of the pump, the sufferer is restored to existence by being laid in a bed and covered with warm clothes. A giddiness of the head and oppression of the breast follows this operation for a day or two and sometimes longer. The object of calling me to be a witness of this new mode of torture, doubtlessly was to intimidate me from running away. But, like medicines administered by empirics, the spectacle had precisely the opposite effect from that which it was expected to produce. After my arrival on this estate, my intention had been to defer my elopement until the next year, before I had seen the torture inflicted on this unfortunate woman but from that moment my resolution was unalterably fixed to escape as quickly as possible. Such was my desperation of feeling at this time that I deliberated seriously upon the project of endeavouring to make my way southward for the purpose of joining the Indians in Florida. Fortune reserved a more agreeable fate for me. On the Saturday night after the woman was punished at the pump, I stole a yard of cotton bagging from the cotton gin house, and converted it into a bag by means of a coarse needle and thread that I borrowed from one of the black women. On the next morning, when our weekly rations were distributed to us, my portion was carefully placed in my bag, under pretense of fears that it would be stolen from me, if it was left open in the loft of the kitchen that I lodged in. This day being Sunday, I did not go to the field to work as usual on that day, but, under pretense of being unwell, remained in the kitchen all day, to be better prepared for the toils of the following night. After daylight had totally disappeared, taking my bag under my arm, under pretense of going to the mill to grind my corn, I stole softly across the cotton fields to the nearest woods, and, taking an observation of the stars, directed my course to the eastward, resolved that in no event should anything induce me to travel a single yard on the high road until at least one hundred miles from this plantation. Keeping on steadily through the whole of the night, and meeting with no swamps or briery thickets in my way, I have no doubt that before daylight the plantation was more than thirty miles behind me. 
Twenty years before this I had been in Savannah, and noted at that time that great numbers of ships were in that port, taking in and loading cotton. My plan was now to reach Savannah in the best way I could, by some means to be devised after my arrival in the city to procure a passage to some of the northern cities. When day appeared before me, I was in a large cotton field, and before the woods could be reached it was gray dawn, but the forest bordering on the field was large, and afforded me good shelter through the day, under the cover of a large thicket of swamp laurel that lay at the distance of a quarter of a mile from the field. It now became necessary to kindle a fire, for all my stock of provisions, consisting of corn and potatoes, was raw and undressed. Less fortunate now than in my former flight, no fire apparatus was in my possession, and driven at last to the extremity, I determined to endeavor to produce fire by rubbing two sticks together, and spent at least two hours of incessant toil in this vain operation, without the least prospect of success. Abandoning this project at length, I turned my thoughts to searching for a stone of some kind, with which to endeavor to extract fire from an old jackknife that had been my companion in Maryland for more than three years. My labors were fruitless, no stone could be found in this swamp, and the day was passed in anxiety and hunger, a few raw potatoes being my only food. Night at length came, and with it a renewal of my traveling labors. Avoiding with the utmost care every appearance of a road, and pursuing my way until daylight, I must have traveled at least thirty miles this night. A while before day, in crossing a field, I fortunately came upon a bed of large pebbles on the side of a hill. Several of these were deposited in my bag, which enabled me, when day arrived, to procure fire with which I parched corn and roasted potatoes, sufficient to subsist me for two or three days. On the fourth night of my journey, fortune directed me to a broad open highway that appeared to be much travelled. Near the side of this road I established my quarters for the day, in a thick pine wood, for the purpose of making observations upon the people who travelled it, and of judging thence of the part of the country to which it led. Soon after daylight a wagon passed along, drawn by oxen, and loaded with bales of cotton. Then followed some white men on horseback, and soon after sunrise a whole train of wagons and carts, all loaded with bales of cotton, passed by, following the wagon first seen by me. In the course of the day at least one hundred wagons and carts passed along this road, towards the southeast, all laden with cotton bales, and at least an equal number came towards the west, either laden with casks of various dimensions, or entirely empty. Numerous horsemen, many carriages, and great numbers of persons on foot also passed to and fro on this road in the course of the day. All these indications satisfied me that I must be near some large town, the seat of an extensive cotton market, the next consideration with me was to know how far it was to this town, for which purpose I determined to travel on the road the succeeding night. Lying in the woods until about eleven o'clock, I rose, came to the road, and travelled it until within an hour of daylight, at which time the country around me appeared almost wholly clear of timber, and houses became much more numerous than they had been in the former part of my journey. Things continued to wear this aspect until daylight, when I stopped and sat down by the side of a high fence that stood beside the road. After remaining here a short time, a wagon laden with cotton passed along, drawn by oxen, whose driver, a black man, asked me if I was going towards town. Being answered in the affirmative, he then asked me if I did not wish to ride in his wagon. I told him I had been out of town all night, and should be very thankful to him for a ride, at the same time ascending his wagon and placing myself in a secure and easy position on the bags of cotton. In this manner we travelled on for about two hours, when we entered the town of Savannah. In my situation there was no danger of any one suspecting me to be a runaway slave, 
for no runaway had ever been known to flee from the country and seek refuge in Savannah. The man who drove the wagon passed through several of the principal streets of the city, and stopped his team before a large warehouse, standing on a wharf, looking into the river. Here I assisted my new friend to unload his cotton, and when we were done he invited me to share his breakfast with him, consisting of cornbread, roasted potatoes, and some cold-boiled rice. Whilst we were at our breakfast, a black man came along the street, and asked us if we knew where he could hire a hand to help him to work a day or two. I at once replied that my master had sent me to town to hire myself out for a few weeks, and that I was ready to go with him immediately. The joy I felt at finding employment so overcame me that all thought of my wages was forgotten. Bidding farewell to the man who had given me my breakfast, and thanking him in my heart for his kindness, I followed my new employer, who informed me that he had engaged to remove a thousand bales of cotton from a large warehouse to the end of a wharf at which a ship lay, that was taking in the cotton as a load. This man was a slave, but he hired his time of his master at two hundred and fifty dollars a year, which he said he paid in monthly installments. He did what he called job work, which consisted of undertaking jobs and hiring men to work under him if the job was too great to be performed by himself. In the present instance he had hired seven or eight black men beside me, all hired to help him remove the cotton in wheelbarrows and lay it near the end of the wharf, when it was taken up by sailors and carried on board the ship that was receiving it. We continued working hard all day and amongst the crew of the ship was a black man with whom I resolved to become acquainted by some means. Accordingly, at night, after we had quit our work, I went to the end of the wharf against which the ship lay moored, and stood there a long time, waiting for the black sailor to make his appearance on deck. At length my desires were gratified. He came upon the deck, and sat down near the mainmast with a pipe in his mouth, which he was smoking with great apparent pleasure. After a few minutes I spoke to him, for he had not yet seen me as it appeared, and when he heard my voice he rose up and came to the side of the ship near where I stood. We entered into conversation together, in the course of which he informed me that his home was in New York, that he had a wife and several children there, but that he followed the sea for a livelihood and knew no other mode of life. He also asked me where my master lived, and if Georgia had always been the place of my residence. I deemed this a favorable opportunity of effecting the object I had in view, in seeking the acquaintance of this man, and told him at once that by law and justice I was a free man, but had been kidnapped near Baltimore, forcibly brought to Georgia, and sold there as a slave that I was now a fugitive from my master, and in search of some means of getting back to my wife and children. The man seemed moved by the account of my sufferings, and at the close of my narrative told me he could not receive me on board the ship, as the captain had given positive orders to him not to let any of the negroes of Savannah come on board, lest they should steal something belonging to the ship. He further told me that he was on watch, and should continue on deck two hours, that he was forced to take a turn of watching the ship every night for two hours, but that his turn would not come the next night until after midnight. I now begged him to enable me to secret myself on board the ship, previous to the time of her sailing, so that I might be conveyed to Philadelphia, whither the ship was bound with her load of cotton. He at first received my application with great coldness, and said he would not do anything contrary to the orders of the captain. But before we parted, he said he should be glad to assist me if he could, but that the execution of the plan proposed by me would be attended with great dangers, if not ruin. End of chapter 20, part 1